Hey there, YouTube. It's the best wrestling night of the week, which means AEW Dynamite on TNT. More importantly, it's Tag Team Appreciation Night. So I got my Young Bucks shirt on here to get me in the spirit. As always, I'm trying to get this channel up and running from scratch, which is really hard to do. So please, if you found me and you enjoy my content, then like, share, and subscribe to help me grow. You can also talk to me over on Twitter, at TSU Optimist, or check out my fledgling Instagram, at Wrestling Optimist. With all that out of the way, and for a review and a little bit of fantasy booking, let's take it over to the action figures. Actually, I don't really have any action figures for these first couple of segments, so let's just recap instead. Dynamite opens with the revelation that there are fans in the stands, and I don't like this. I don't like to see them taking any unnecessary risks, but maybe that's just me. Throughout the night, we hear from various tag teams on the roster telling us about their favorite teams of all time. Appropriately, we start with tag team action. The Young Bucks come out to take on Evil Luno and Stu Grayson. But numbers 3, 4, and 5 of the Dark Order attack them on the stage. Those guys stick around at ringside for intimidation purposes, but early on, Matt Jackson takes them all out with a dive. Later in the match, we get a series of super kicks because, well, it's the Young Bucks and Super Kick Fiesta! Stu Grayson throws Matt Jackson into the babyface tunnel, and the Dark Order's minions trap him there. But when Uno sets up the double team on Nick, he gets rolled up instead, and the Bucks win. At this point, I've tried four times at three different Walmarts, and I cannot find a single AEW unrivaled action figure. So, I can't display the Young Bucks matches yet. Unfortunately, even online, they're on back order until October or November, depending on the figure. So it doesn't look like I'm likely to get any of these anytime soon. Unless I get really lucky in stores. Oh well, what are you gonna do? MJF comes out of the locker room. He compliments his new gum guy, but scolds Nina the intern for taking credit. As he walks down the hall, he shoves Lee Johnson for being in the shot. That's the guy from last week who apparently couldn't hang a picture right. Out in the ring, MJF is once again at his Burberry podium for a campaign speech. We're asked to use his hashtags, then Nina the intern shows us his poll numbers, which have MJF beating John Moxley by 1,500 percentage points. Even though JR told us that Mox is definitely in the building, MJF claims that Dictator John isn't here. And unlike him, he'll show up every week as champion. He then claims that John isn't comfortable around wrestlers who won't count the lights for him, so MJF lays down on his back for the rest of the promo. He says John isn't a real leader, so he should just hand over the keys to the AEW car to MJF. After all, we deserve better. Moxley's music plays and MJF sends his bodyguards into the crowd where Mox usually comes out. But this time, he comes out of the tunnel and attacks a now alone MJF, throwing him into his own podium and hitting him with the paradigm shift. Moxley grabs a mic backstage and says at All Out, he's going to teach MJF a very painful lesson. For my fantasy book, a lot of people, including MJF, have compared Moxley to Stone Cold, but I still get more of a Brian Pillman vibe. Regardless, if he was the second coming of the Rattlesnake, he would need a heel authority figure to play off. Since AEW doesn't have that, I'm glad they're using MJF instead. Either way, I think we're slowly approaching the end of Moxley's reign, so maybe it's time to give one of these monsters a chance, like Brian Cage or Lance Archer. Could give the whole show a completely different feel. A stitched-up Matt Hardy is getting interviewed backstage about the injury he suffered at the hands of Sammy Guevara last week. Matt says he doesn't die, and he's going to be seeing red until he makes Sammy bleed. Matt will be medically cleared in 10 days, just in time for a special Saturday night edition of Dynamite. 
That's when he'll unleash his rage and end Sammy. Suddenly, Matt attacks a guy in a leather jacket that he thinks is Sammy, but it turns out to just be referee Mike Posey. Whoops. There's a great picture on Matt Hardy's Twitter account of his five personalities. Team Extreme, Version 1, Broken Matt, Big Money Matt, and some Young Bucks ripoff that I'm not familiar with. I'm excited for this feud with Sammy, but I also want to see Matt follow up on his promo from last week. He said he was going to listen to the fans and just be himself. Once we get past this accidental blood angle, I really want to see what normal Matt Hardy is like. We see a specially designed tunnel for Scorpio Sky's entrance, showing a backstage door. Just like he said he would, he kicks that door down, making his way to the ring. Meanwhile, the entire Nightmare family accompanies Cody to the ring, looking like an entourage and giving this a big fight feel. We get word that the TNT Championship belt is finally finished, and the cameras make sure to show it off. I've been using my NXT UK belt because I have three of them, and it's actually my favorite belt. Both men shake hands to start the match out of respect. AEW's commentary is worlds better than WWE's, and it really shows in matches like this. I don't even notice the lack of crowd because they do such a good job filling in the silence. Especially Taz, with his supposed encyclopedic knowledge of wrestling holds and moves. Scorpio Sky gets a near fall with a roll-up, and goes for the TKO, but it's countered into a crossroads. Sky kicks out at two, and everyone is shocked. JR even asks, who kicks out of the crossroads? Um, everyone, JR. However, you don't kick out of two of them, and the second one puts away Scorpio Sky. Mr. Brody Lee interrupts the celebration holding the old, unfinished TNT Championship belt. He claims to have dispatched of the Elite, so now he's coming for Cody. At the special Saturday Night Dynamite, he's going to take Cody's fancy new belt and give him back this crummy old one. I love how they're incorporating the old belt, and this is a really good setup for a feud, so no fantasy booking required. Next up is a tag team title match between the current champions Kenny Omega and Hangman Adam Page versus Jurassic Express. On their way to the ring, Luchasaurus looks into the camera and says, Hi mom, it only took 65 million years, but we're finally giving this dinosaur a title shot. Love you. That was brilliant. As the match starts, JR points out that Marco has been getting involved in matches a lot lately, and he's right. Why are these baby faces cheating all the time? Jungle Boy spends the bulk of the match playing the baby face in peril until he finally gets the hot tag. Luchasaurus must have heard my criticisms about moving slowly last week because he rattles off a quick series of acrobatic moves and some big kicks to gain control. Kenny Omega gets tossed out of the ring, much to Marco Stunt's delight, so Omega gives him a snapdragon suplex on the concrete. I commented during my dark reactions how AEW seems to heavily rely on referee distractions. And sure enough, we get another one here. It allows Luchasaurus to throw Marco's stunt at Kenny. Again with the heel tactics. That leads to a double team and a couple of near falls. But a last call helps the champions retain. The three AEW figures that I'm most looking forward to are Luchasaurus, Orange Cassidy, and Darby Allin but none of them are even in the works right now. That's surprising because all three gimmicks lend themselves to action figures and are super kid-friendly. Santana and Ortiz don't care how best friends got home last week after they trashed Trent's mom's van. In fact, they warn best friends to watch where they keep their stuff as they hold up suitcases. They dump out the contents into the shower and cover them in bleach. I don't think they'll be apologizing to anyone anytime soon. Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, The Rock and Roll Express, FTR, and The Young Bucks are all in the ring for Tag Team Appreciation Night. Matt Jackson says The Rock and Roll Express pioneered the very style that he and his brother used to this very day. They've paved the way for the Rockers and the Hardys. The Bucks wouldn't be here without them, so they just want to say thank you. Dax Harwood says he brought Tully and Arn here because he's a huge mark for them. He spent seven years promoting tag team wrestling with his best friend, and he's been able to provide for his family because of what these legends did for the business. 
Ricky Morton takes the mic and says he hasn't seen chemistry like FTR since Tully and Arn. But the Bucks are their generation's best tag team in the world. Arn compliments what the Bucks have done for tag team wrestling in the modern age, and calls the Rock and Roll Express the tag team of their century. He knows he's going to ruffle some feathers, but the current best tag team in the world is FTR. In typical surly fashion, Tully Blanchard tries to pick a fight with the Rock and Roll Express before saying that the best team is the one with the championships, so neither FTR nor the Young Bucks are the best. Tully turns to Arn, still mad about when he interfered in the Cody vs. Sean Spears match a year ago. He doesn't understand Arn's relationship with the Nightmare family. Speaking of Sean Spears, he starts to creep out of the tunnel and towards the ring. Arn leaves as Robert Gibson punches Tully and chaos ensues. Dax sells his knee injury as the Bucks escort Tully up the ramp. Suddenly, FTR attacks Rock and Roll Express and leave them laid out in the ring. Legendary referee Mike Chioda is getting interviewed backstage when he's interrupted by Chris Jericho. Jericho claims that 18 years ago, he saved Kyoto's job, so that's why he wanted him here tonight to officiate Jericho's match with Orange Cassidy. He's confident, but just in case, he wants to make sure that Kyoto will do the right thing, wink wink. Kyoto says that he's going to call it right down the middle, but Jericho just thinks that's a code word. He infers that if Kyoto helps him cheat, he'll help him get a permanent job with AEW. In the only women's action of the night, the champion Hikaru Shida takes on the debuting Heather Monroe, a stereotypical blonde in pink gear. Monroe attacks right at the bell to get the early advantage. On commentary, JR plugs the heels social network, then his barbecue sauce. Heather manages to reverse the falcon arrow and gets a near fall, but she gets caught in an interesting submission and taps out. Tony Schiavone interviews Sheeta on the ramp. She's waiting on challengers. Bring them on. Back in the locker room, Jake the Snake cuts a promo while Lance Archer beats up jobbers in the background again. When Jake doesn't convey the correct message, Lance rips his shirt apart, revealing everybody dies in Sharpie written on Jake's back. It's main event time, and you can tell Jericho is so happy to have even a small crowd back. The first thing he does is taunt them for being too quiet. Unlike normal, Orange Cassidy doesn't start slow and is legit brawling from the opening bell. I guess he is taking this seriously. Cassidy does a dive and even a hands in his pockets drop off the top rope as he takes complete control. Jericho slows down the pace though. Orange plays possum before super kicking Jericho in the face. He tries for a Hurricane Rana, but it's reversed into the walls of Jericho. Cassidy gets out and turns that into an ankle lock. Eventually, Jericho goes to the outside and gets his bat. When Mike Kyoto admonishes him, Jericho screams at him to turn his back. He reluctantly starts to oblige, but then has a change of heart and grabs the bat from Jericho. Cassidy takes advantage and delivers an orange punch, which is essentially a Superman punch. Santana and Ortiz come running out to interfere, but they're stopped by best friends. However, it distracts Mike Kyoto long enough for Jake Hager to slam Orange Cassidy without being noticed. But that only gets a two count. The Judas effect misses, and Cassidy gets the surprise roll-up for the win. Overall, this was another decent episode. I feel like AEW fits more stories and well-thought-out characters into two hours than WWE does in three hours with triple the roster. We got a competitive TNT Championship match with Cody and Scorpio Sky, some debuts, and lots of setup for that special Saturday show coming up. However, the goal of the night was highlighting tag teams, and in my opinion, they nailed this. We saw just how many great teams AEW has on full display, and even the teams not competing got on screen with those video packages. The ceremony had just enough nostalgia while putting the current guys over and advancing their stories with the Elite. Plus, we got a very entertaining championship match with one of my favorites, Jurassic Express. It was all fantastic, but with that said, the criticisms of the women's division continue. Although MJF was good again, 
he was much better last week. And even though it was a decent match, I think the main event was my least favorite encounter of the Chris Jericho Orange Cassidy feud. I still had fun, but this was middle of the road. Anyway, that'll do it for this week's Dynamite. If you've managed to find me and you're enjoying this content, please do all the normal YouTube stuff. Hit that like button, share with any wrestling or action figure nerds you might know, and of course, subscribe to the channel. Spread the word, and again, feel free to talk to me over on Twitter, at PSU Optimus, or on Instagram, at Wrestling Optimus. Check back for another action figure review of SmackDown on Saturday, but until then, I'll catch you later.